welcome! In this film, we'll discuss X-rays. From previous films, you will remember that alpha, beta, and gamma radiation are emitted from the nuclei of radioactive atoms. X-rays, in contrast, are emitted outside the nucleus when electrons lose energy. Most human exposure to X-rays is caused by machinery that uses high voltage electricity in medicine and industry. X-rays were discovered in 1895 by Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen at the University of Würzburg in Germany. At the time, neither Röntgen nor anyone else understood the nature of the newly discovered rays. Röntgen first encountered X-rays as he was experimenting with early versions of tubes that emitted cathode rays. In the late 1800s, scientists were not sure what cathode rays were. However, we now know that cathode rays are streams of high-speed electrons. While working in a darkened room, Röntgen noticed something unexpected. When he turned on the cathode ray tube, a screen painted with chemicals began fluorescing several feet away, well beyond the reach of the cathode rays. Röntgen wasn't sure what was causing the screen to fluoresce, but he performed several experiments that proved it was something other than the cathode rays. Since the nature of the new radiation was mysterious, Röntgen named the rays X after the mathematical symbol for the unknown. Sometimes X-rays are also referred to as Röntgen rays. Röntgen kept his discovery secret for several weeks. As he worked alone in his darkened lab, he placed objects between cathode ray tubes and the fluorescent screen. These experiments demonstrated that X-rays passed easily through some materials, but not others. Once, while holding an object, he was startled by the image on the screen, which clearly revealed the bones of his own hand. This image is believed to be the first radiograph of human anatomy ever made. Röntgen created the image by placing his wife's hand on a photographic plate and then turning on the cathode ray tube. It has been reported that Röntgen's wife, who was named Anna Bertha, was shocked by the image and immediately left her husband's laboratory. Röntgen's first paper on X-rays was published about seven weeks after his initial discovery and his sensational findings were widely publicized. Since cathode ray tubes were already in use throughout the world, countless researchers and hobbyists immediately began performing their own experiments with X-rays. Within a few months, reports began surfacing about serious injuries believed to be caused by the rays. Some X-ray enthusiasts heeded the warnings and took steps to protect themselves, however, others did not. The medical and scientific literature from the late 1800s and early 1900s contains many reports of devastating radiation burns, amputations, cancers, and deaths among workers who were either unaware or skeptical about the X-ray's harmful effects. By a stroke of good luck, Röntgen's own X-ray exposures were believed to be minimal. This is partly because, even before the harmful effects of X-rays were known, Röntgen carried out many of his experiments 
inside a large box with walls made of zinc and lead, having only a tiny aperture for x-rays to enter from the cathode ray tubes located outside the box. Furthermore, after working with x-rays for a brief period, Rintgen moved on to other research interests. To illustrate the casual manner in which x-rays were sometimes used, consider the case of Herbert Hawkes, published less than a year after x-rays were discovered. Hawkes, an assistant at Columbia University, was publicly demonstrating x-rays at Bloomingdale Brothers Department Store in New York City. Hawks repeatedly displayed the anatomy of his skull and jaw bones by placing his head near powerful x-ray equipment while customers in the store watched the images on fluorescent x-ray viewing screens. Also, when adjusting his equipment, he frequently imaged the bones in his hands. Hawks exposed himself to x-rays in this manner for several hours a day but he was forced to quit after four days when radiation burns started to appear. Initially, the skin on Hawk's hands became dry. Then, his hands became painful, red, and swollen. After two weeks, all of the skin came off his hands. His fingernails also stopped growing and later fell out. In addition, the hair fell out on his face, the sides of his head, and other areas that had been exposed. His vision was impaired, his chest was burned, and doctors stated that he appeared as though he had been parboiled, a term used to describe food that is boiled until it starts to become soft, but not fully cooked. More serious effects of truly massive x-ray exposures are illustrated by the case of Maran Kasabian, a pioneer in medical imaging and radiation therapy. Kasabian used x-rays to make radiographic plates. He also examined patients using fluoroscopes, devices with screens that fluoresce in the presence of x-rays. Unlike radiographic plates, which take time to develop, fluoroscopes allow x-ray examination of patients in real time. Fluoroscopes vary in size from large stationary structures to small handheld devices. X-ray pioneers were exposed to high doses of radiation when they examined patients with fluoroscopes. In addition, they often added to their exposure by imaging their own hands while adjusting equipment. Kasabian used fluoroscopes to assist with battlefield surgery during the Spanish-American War. During his two years in the service, he performed over 3,000 fluoroscopic examinations and made about 800 radiographic plates, all with little or no consideration for his own safety. In 1899, Kasabian's left hand became inflamed as a result of his exposure to x-rays. After the initial inflammation, he suffered intense itching of the hand and the skin became tough, glossy, swollen, and yellow. The condition was also extremely painful. Similar but less severe effects also afflicted his right hand. As Kasabian's condition deteriorated over time, his left hand became ulcerated and cancerous. He underwent a partial amputation of fingers in April of 1908, but the cancer spread and other operations were necessary in 1909. He died of radiation-induced cancer in 1910, 11 years after the redness in his hands first appeared. Kasabian was not the first to die from x-ray-induced cancer. 
Earlier victims in the U.S. included Clarence Daly, an assistant to Thomas Edison. Daly was severely burned while working with x-rays. In the words of Edison, Daly's hair came out and his flesh commenced to ulcerate. After enduring multiple amputations involving both of his hands and arms, he died at age 39 of radiation-induced cancer just eight years after he had begun working with x-rays. The first American woman known to have died of x-ray-induced cancer was Elizabeth Fleischmann Oshine, who used x-rays in research, medicine, and dentistry. Like other x-ray pioneers, she began experiencing dermatitis early in her career. X-ray damage to her skin was followed by cancer and multiple amputations. She died of radiation-induced cancer in 1905, just eight years after beginning her work with x-rays. Although deaths from x-ray-induced cancer were once common among radiological personnel, x-ray procedures and equipment have become much safer over the years, and the massive overexposures that were once common have now become exceedingly rare. Before discussing modern methods of worker protection, let's briefly consider how x-rays may be produced in medicine and industry. In one type of x-ray tube, known as a Coolidge tube, an electric current passes through a metal filament. The filament is also known as a cathode. A short distance from the filament, there is a metal target. During operation, Electrical current is applied to the filament, causing it to heat up. As the temperature rises to high levels, excited electrons start to break away from the filament. While this is happening, a powerful electrical current is applied to other components in a way that creates a strong positive charge on the end of the tube where the metal target is located. Since electrons have negative electrical charges, they are drawn at high speeds toward the metal target, which is also known as an anode. The high-speed electrons are the so-called cathode rays that Rentgen and others were studying in the late 19th century. Remember, however, that cathode rays or electrons are not x-rays. The actual x-rays are released when high-speed electrons interact with atoms in the metal target. Prior to Rentgen's discovery, no one knew that x-rays existed. Let's examine the process in more detail. In many x-ray machines, the metal target contains tungsten, a heavy element with 74 protons and about 110 neutrons. When incoming electrons bombard the metal target, a few of them interact with the atoms of tungsten. In some cases, an incoming electron changes course as it passes near a tungsten atom's nucleus. While changing course, the electron slows down and loses energy. As it loses energy, the electron emits an x-ray. This process is called bremsstrahlung, a German word meaning breaking radiation. In other words, the electron slows down or puts on the brakes as it loses energy and changes course. Incoming electrons may trigger x-rays in other ways. In some cases, a high-speed electron will disrupt a tungsten atom's own electron cloud. This disruption may eject one of the tungsten atom's inner electrons. This leaves a vacancy in the electron cloud. 
an electron from farther out in the cloud then drops down to fill the inner vacancy. As it drops into the lower level, this electron loses energy and emits an X-ray. This type of X-ray production is called K-shell emission because it begins in the electron cloud's inner region, an area known as the K-shell. The reshuffling of electrons creates a new vacancy farther out in the electron cloud. The process repeats itself until the electron cloud becomes stable once again. X-rays are similar to gamma rays. We might think of them as very high frequency light that is invisible to our eyes. In fact, one well-known early researcher often referred to X-rays as X-light. As with gamma rays, X-ray overexposures have been associated with a variety of health effects including those shown here. In general, higher X-ray doses are associated with greater risks. Risks also tend to be higher for children and fetuses compared with adults. Overall, Occupational X-ray exposures to medical personnel have dropped dramatically since early in the 20th century. Past exposures were high in part because X-ray equipment was often exposed and unshielded. Some medical practitioners worked in close proximity to the unshielded X-ray equipment for long periods of time. As the risks became better appreciated, workers began protecting themselves somewhat by covering vulnerable body parts with heavy aprons and gloves. Still, medical personnel were often exposed to secondary or scattered radiation produced when X-rays interacted with materials in the radiological environment. These days, equipment is heavily shielded to confine X-rays to a focused beam. Here, medical personnel are positioning the X-ray machine using a harmless beam of visible light. It is safe for workers to be in the room at this time because no X-rays are currently present. Before turning on the X-ray beam, however, radiology workers retreat to the safety of a room with lead-lined walls and a leaded glass viewing window. The workers will then activate the X-ray equipment from within the protection of the shielded control room. Sometimes medical personnel have to hold a patient in position while taking an x-ray. In these cases, the worker is careful to position herself outside the x-ray's direct beam, and she wears a full-length leaded apron to shield her torso from scattered x-rays. To protect workers in other parts of the medical building, X-ray rooms are lined with lead or other dense materials. Here, we see a sheet of lead in the door to the X-ray room. Finally, medical personnel wear film badges or other monitoring devices to record any unintentional X-ray exposure that may occur. Modern protections have made it possible for some medical personnel to work their entire careers with no measurable exposure to radiation beyond the background levels that occur naturally in everyday environments. One newly emerging concern is the potential for increased X-ray exposures to medical personnel due to the proliferation of fluoroscopically guided procedures such as heart catheterization. Time will tell whether these exposures 
represent a substantial new risk to workers in radiological medicine. This concludes our video on x-rays.